You know, we've really just scratched the surface of the questions Jesus asked. We've seen the one about fear. We discussed the one with the obvious answer and even the one about love, but today it's different. Today we're faced with the most important question Jesus ever asked, and it is powerful. It's powerful because its answer carries the weight of eternity. Good morning, church. Uh, let me try that again for everyone in the room. Good morning, church. Listen, I think sometimes we're afraid to clap. We just made a declaration that Jesus Christ is our living hope. I think that's something to get excited about, don't you? The fact that Christ is our living hope, um, man, what a, what a powerful declaration. It's a privilege to be here and to preach. Uh, it's a privilege to, to stand before you as we call this our home church. It's a privilege to preach around the country and around the world, which the Lord has allowed me to do. It's a, it's a privilege to minister to a generation of college people that, that are absolutely, I believe, vital in the next revival coming. And so uh, I stand before you humbled and I stand before you, uh, like I said, privileged and excited uh, to just be in front of you today. So Jamie, thank you for the opportunity. Um, college students and our praise team, thank you for leading us uh, this morning. Uh, if you got your Bibles, I would ask to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 16. We've been in this uh, series, the questions that Jesus asked, and even last week, Jamie said that this is the the question. We're going to get to that in a minute, but uh, beforehand, um, I, I again am just, just uh, excited that you're here. Thank well, that you're that you're here this morning. I know we have some guests and some visitors, and and so it's uh, it's awesome to be in the house. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord? That's another option where you can clap if you would like to at this time. All right. So awesome, awesome. So the questions, and we're going to get to this. I want to to read this text to you this morning, um, and then I'll go back. And there's some questions that we'll have as the main points, but there is a central question amongst them uh, that we're going to look at. And so I uh, uh, I'm just ready to go. Matthew chapter 16 is where we are, starting in verse 13. So Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, and so on. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He was asking His disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Verse 15, He said to them, But who do you say that I am. And Peter answered, Simon Peter, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father it, who is in heaven uh, did the revealing. In verse 18, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Verse 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. In verse 20, he ends this text, which will be uh, the majority of our time. Uh, he says, Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. And so I said that we will be in 16 for the majority of the message, but we'll also be in another uh, book in uh, another chapter in Matthew here in a little bit. So as we go back and as we circle back to the uh, chapter uh, 16, verse 13, uh, let's break this down a little bit. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, now let me just mention something to you about this specific Caesarea Philippi. Um, it's to be distinguished from the magnificent city of Caesarea. So we've heard of Caesarea in, in, the, in the Gospels and in the Bible. Um, that was built by Herod the Great. 
uh, and that had been on the coast of the Mediterranean uh, Sea. But Caesarea Philippi was built by Herod's son Philip. It's basically north of the Sea of Galilee, so this is a different uh, location, different city. And it's interesting as I was looking at this in preparation of this morning uh, to come to the realization that uh, Caesarea Philippi was built in honor of a Greek god. There is actually, there was a shrine that was located in Caesarea Philippi to this Greek god. And why do I mention that? And this is the reason, because this region is very pagan. This region is very lost. This region is very dark. And so when we're looking at the location, and we're looking at the city, and we're talking about not Caesarea, but Caesarea Philippi, there's two different distinguishings there, because we see that in this, and looking at this this text, that, that they built this in honor of a uh, Greek God. And by the way, that's a small g, not the capital one, because there's only one God that deserves that. And as we look at this, and as we look at Caesarea Philippi, pagan society, pagan lost culture, he asked his disciples this question, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, if I were to ask you, what would be a definition or an answer, because I don't know if you agree with what I'm about to say, but I think that maybe the United States necessarily isn't called Caesarea Philippi, but it does seem like our culture today is lost. That our culture today is possibly even pagan, similar to what is happening here. So if you were to ask uh, someone that you know, or if, if, if somebody in, this, in our culture today, how would they define who Jesus Christ is? Listen, some people... Uh, would say, uh, maybe just a good guy. Some people would say and believe uh, that he is my brother. Some people would say uh, a bunch of different things. There's also people in our culture, you know this and so do I. I mean, I have uh, people in my life that I'm even close to that they would say, Jesus Christ is nothing to me. I don't, I, don't, I don't accept what you say about Him. I actually reject what you say about Him. And so when Jesus and His boys roll up into Caesarea Philippi, this is what He says. So when you're out at the KFC, they didn't have that. Just joking. Anybody awake out there? Listen, there's no Kentucky Fried Chicken in Caesarea Philippi. Just joking. There's not a Wendy's either. All right? And so, as he says, he says, so when you're out and about in the culture, who does the culture say that I am? That's exactly what this question is. And the first question in our questions this morning, it's not the pivotal one, it's not the most important one, but he's leading to it. It's like, what does our culture say? How does our culture define who Christ is. And so what happens in this text as we see um, when he asks that question in verse 13, verse 14, it says they, he's with his disciples. And so this is the response of the disciples that's with him in chapter 16. They say this, some say John the Baptist and others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, we have had a series, one of my favorite, in the time that we've been here, on John the Baptist. John the Baptist absolutely knew who he was. John the Baptist absolutely knew who he wasn't. He was the one that set the tone. He was the one that set the pace. He was the one that got to introduce the Messiah. Some thought maybe he was him. No, related to him, close to him, but John the Baptist was not the Messiah. He said, I don't, I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes, basically, is what John the Baptist says. But I don't know if you recognize this in this text. But at this time in Matthew 16, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, and other prophets all have one thing in common. I don't know if you know what it is. I'm glad that you asked because I'm going to tell you that John the Baptist, Elijah... Jeremiah or another prophet are all dead. So when Jesus says, 
Who does this culture, who does the people say that I am? John the Baptist has already been beheaded. Elijah is an Old Old Testament prophet. Jeremiah, Old Testament weeping prophet, or some other Old Testament prophet that that they're referring to. All these people are dead. Now let me just stop and say this. The fact is why I was a little bit pumped up coming up here talking about the, that Jesus Christ is our hope. Listen, He's not just our hope. He's our living hope. Because He's not dead. He did die, but He's not dead anymore. And Jesus Christ is my living hope. And if you have given your life to Him today, that you could stand before others and say, I have no problem in saying that Christ is my living hope. That Christ is my Savior of my sin. That Christ is my Lord. And that means boss. And we'll get to that in a second. But they say, John the Baptist, Elijah... Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And in my opinion, the question above all questions that Jesus Christ asked in the Scriptures, particularly in this next verse, happens in verse 15. So we ask Him, who does the culture define as who I am today? I ask you that same question. We could come up with different answers but here's the deal. Here's the, here's the right hook, the, the, the right punch, whatever you want to call that. He says to them, but who do you say that I am? And so number two of the questions this morning, after we see number one, how does our culture define who Jesus is today? Number two is, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus Christ to you? That is the question of the hour. That is the question of the series. That's the question above all questions. Who is Jesus Christ to you? And I stand before you not ashamed of the fact that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I believe that He died not to save me from hell, but He died to save me from my sin. He died to save me in the blood of Christ from my sin. Now, being in heaven and not hell is a bonus of that. But Jesus Christ, when He went to the cross for you, and He went to the cross for you, and He went to the cross for you and for me and everybody else in here and everyone else on this planet, He went to the cross to save you from your sin. I have no problems saying from a pulpit or outside or in another state or in another country that Jesus Christ is my Savior. Jesus Christ is my Lord. But who is Jesus to you, my friend? There could be somebody in this room that if you were to answer the question, who is Jesus to me, it would be no answer. There would be no answer to that because you don't have a relationship with Christ. You've never come to a relationship or a place in your life where you have accepted what Jesus has done for you. And man, what has He done for you? He's done everything for you. But so many times, even in our culture, there are people that hear the gospel truth and they turn and walk away because they want to be their own boss. They want to be their own God. And I'm telling you this morning, there's no greater decision. As I get to travel the country and whatever, there's no greater decision that anybody can ever make than to follow Christ as their Lord and Savior. There's no other decision that's better than that. Can I thank you for that amen here in Joplin, Great Missouri. All right, so here we go. And Simon Peter jumps up, man. Doesn't he always kind of jump to the forefront of the questions? I mean, if you know anything about Simon Peter, the disciple, man, he's always answering the questions. He's always jumping. Listen, you know, there's a reason because he's the leader of the group. He's the leader of the pack. He's the oldest one. He, and we know that by, by text, so it's, at least we think that he is the oldest of the 12 disciples. Verse 16, Simon Peter jumps at the question and he answers and he says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who is Jesus to you this morning? Who is Jesus to you? And Simon Peter replies, You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. God. This is the same Simon Peter 
that cut off a guy's ear, and Jesus picked it back up and put it on the man's head. This is the same Simon Peter that was physically able to walk on water because Jesus called him to him. This is the same Simon Peter who didn't deny Christ once, twice, but three times. This is the same Simon Peter who when Jesus says, I'm going to wash your feet, he said, I don't want you to wash my feet. And he says, if I don't wash your feet, Pete, you don't belong to me. So Peter says, wash everything about me then. This guy is beginning to get a declaration and a, and a moment in his life, man, where Jesus is fixing to tell him, I'm going to use you and I'm going to use you for me. And we see that. I say that this morning because if you're in this room, Jesus wants to use you too to bring glory to Him. This life is not about us. This life is not about anything that we can do. This life is about us having the opportunity to pointing people to Jesus Christ because there's a lot of people around us that do not know Christ as our Lord and Savior. They don't have Him as their Lord and Savior because they don't know Him. Well, I'm telling you this, man. What about First Baptist Joplin? What is First Baptist Joplin doing today and tomorrow and the next day to show the world that we live in who our Savior and who our Lord is? Jesus is about to tell Peter, I'm about to do some things with you, boy. Just get ready. And this is all before the denial. All before the cutting off of the ear. All before all that stuff. And we see that in verse 17. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. And we see that declaration right there of Jesus telling him, I'm fixing to use you. The third question in my uh, four points this morning, after how does our culture define who Jesus is today, who Jesus personally is to you, number three is this. Do others know that you have surrendered your life to Christ? Do other people around you, people at your work, people at your school, people at wherever you go grocery shopping, people at whatever the places that you go, do they know stuff about you? Do they know that you have a surrender life? Obviously, I'm speaking to believers in this moment. Do they know that there's something that's different about you, not because you're just a good person, but do they know that you, your life has been bought with a price? Do they know that you are something and someone bigger than yourself? Do they know who you belong to? Do they know us by the way that we live our lives? And we see that in this Peter, this text about him, Peter's name means rock, Petra. And we see that, that in this interpretation of the Scripture, Jesus says, I'm fixing to build my church. Well, we know that the church is built upon Christ, period. It's all about Christ, period. But we also know that in this confession of Peter, that his faith that Jesus is the Messiah, Christ's teachings, which is one of the main, the main emphases in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, is Christ's teachings. We know that when, when Jesus says, I'm fixing to use you, I'm going to build my church on you, we know that Jesus is the, the bedrock of the church. We know that this confession, but we also know that Peter in, him, in himself understood these terms. And I'm telling you what, he's fixing to have a couple of hard days ahead of him. Peter, one of his lowest times in his life, when people ask him, who are you? Aren't you the guy that was with Jesus the other day? Aren't you one of those Jesus freaks? Aren't you one of the, the people that was following Him? And what does He do? Physically, He denies once, twice, three times. 
And then after that, we see that he goes out, man, weeping bitterly. But I'm telling you what, you want to see a cool story in Scripture? Maybe this afternoon in between the games, you go to John chapter 21 and see how Jesus reinstates Peter into the game. He said, you've been on the bench, man. I know you've rejected me. I told you you were going to. Not once, not twice, but three times. But now, son, I told you back in Matthew 16, it's time that you get back into the game. By the time you go from John 21 to Acts chapter 2, Peter is literally on fire again for the gospel of Christ. Preaches his heart out in Acts chapter 2. And thousands come to faith in Christ because of the gospel message sermon of Peter. He's the one that puts his foot in his mouth all the time. He's the one that answers the questions all the time. But I'm telling you what, as we also, as we also know, it's not in Scripture, but we also can see, even amongst of the keys of the kingdom that he's going to give, and how Christ says, listen, you've, re you've referred to me not as just a brother, not as just a friend, but you've referred to me as Messiah. That's a huge statement in the life of Peter, even though he's fixing to mess up. Hey, you know what? You and I mess up too. But God's love for you and the forgiveness of Christ that He gives you, He wants you to get up from messing up and get back into the game for Him. And to get back into whatever you need to do to point people to Christ. You've heard me probably say this before. If He lets me preach again, I'll probably say it again. We either point people to Christ or we point people away from Him. And just because we've messed up or in a slump, it doesn't mean you got to stay there. It means you got to get up, man. Get up, woman. Get up, boy. Get up, girl. And get back into the game. And that's exactly what Jesus does. And by the time we see him in Acts chapter 2, he's going again. Matter of fact, we also know that of the 12 original disciples, that Judas Iscariot took his own life. We also know that John, the, the uh, author of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Revelation, we know that John died of natural causes. And we also know that the other 10 disciples died martyrs' lives. One of them was flayed alive. One of them was beheaded, beaten. They, they say that Peter, when he came to the end of his life, that he was going to be crucified. Theologians believe that he saw that he was going to be crucified and embraced that and accepted it, but said, I'm not worthy to die like my Messiah did. And so we think that when Peter was executed on a cross for his faith that it was upside down and not right side up because he said that he wasn't worthy to be to be taken out or crucified like his Christ was and then we see in verse 20 that he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ why would Jesus do that why would Jesus say, don't tell anybody that I'm the Christ, that I'm the Messiah? And the reason is because there was a false concept of Jewish people. You see, they wanted a leader to come in and swoop into the day, take care of all the political madness, take care of all the oppression that the Romans had given to them. Do you realize that? There was such an oppression upon the Jewish people from the Romans that they wanted a leader to come in on that horse. Come in and save the day. Come in and, and remove the power of Rome. And that's not the, that's not the, the uh, person that Jesus was. J Jesus coming back on a horse talks about that too. But not in this sense. Not in, in this way that the Jewish people come in and man, save us from Rome. Save us from the political oppression and the, just the, the power that this Roman oppression has. That's not, what, that's not what He was coming about. So the warning was, don't tell them that I'm the Christ because we don't need a revolt at this time. We don't need a revolt to the people at Rome because I'm not your political Savior. I'm your soul Savior. I'm your sin Savior. I'm the one that is coming up to get onto the cross in, in a little bit, and I'm going to, to, to let my body be ripped into shreds and bloodshed. I'm going to allow my body to be pierced, and I'm allowed my body to be beaten upon the lack of recognition for you, for your sin, for your, for your mistakes, for your mishaps. 
I'm doing that for you. That's the kind of leader that I am. That's the kind of savior that I am because it's more than just the oppression of, of the Roman whatever. I'm coming and I'm, my, my relationship is deeper than that. And I want to say this to you. There has been the question of who Jesus is uh, since the beginning of time. When Jesus was arriving at the time of Christ, and still people are trying to figure it out. Who is Jesus? And I want to show you a, a, a passage in Scripture. Before I do that, though, I want to preface it by saying this. There's always been this contrast of Jesus Christ, of who is He? I mean, the demons knew who he was. His own family thought he was crazy. You can go back and look at that. We've already, we've already saw that a pagan culture said, well, you're either uh, John the Baptist or some Old Testament dead dude that's come back. We, all these different things. Well, Jesus, in the Scriptures, you can look it up for yourself, a lot of the times was referred to as rabbi, was referred to as master. And, and, and rabbi means Teacher. He was a teacher in Second Temple Palestine. That's who Jesus was. That's who a part of who he was. And a lot of times you can go back and look in the text and people will refer to him as rabbi. Or if you're getting into the original, Rabboni, which means teacher. If you follow me this morning, say I am. And as we think about that, Jesus was a teacher. But Jesus was more than a teacher. You can also look in Scripture, and there are times in Scripture where Jesus is not only being taught or being called rabbi, but he's being called Adonai, which that's a totally different word. It's a totally different meaning, and it's an incredible one, because here's the deal. And you can even, you want to talk about old Peter? Go back and look. And you can see when Jesus comes to Peter and a couple of the other fishermen, future disciples, do you remember the story where he borrows their boat for a few minutes and they cast out a little bit and he begins to kind of teach? And then there's a moment where those dudes were, they were fishing all night long and they didn't catch one thing. Do you remember that story? Well, there's a part in that text where Peter looks to Jesus, calls him master, similar to rabbi teacher because that's who Jesus was. They didn't have the news channels. They didn't have the social medias or or opportunities to text people back then. But by the time Jesus comes onto the scene, people know that, listen, he's more than just a teacher. When Jesus helps them with that miraculous catch, do you know what I'm talking about? Where their boats begin to sink, where, where, where they had to call the other fisher boats to come over. Listen, we're sinking because of all this, this crazy fish catch that we're fixing to just leave. Do you remember that story? He goes from calling him master teacher to Adonai, Lord. You can look at um, other places like Zacchaeus. You remember the wee little Zacchaeus? Yeah, you know that from baby Bible school or whatever we call it, you know what I mean? But Zacchaeus is a wee little man. Zacchaeus didn't want to have a conversation with Jesus. Zacchaeus just wanted to see him, right? He didn't want to have a conversation with him. He climbed up in the, the sycamore tree. Remember that, you know? And Jesus comes on to the deal. Yeah, some of those kids right down there, they're starting to sing the song. I could probably lead you in that, but that's why we had the college students lead worship, not Ryan lead worship this morning. Zacchaeus, no, I'm just kidding. Listen, but there's a point where Zacchaeus goes to Christ and he doesn't call him teacher. He doesn't call him rabbi. He calls him Lord multiple times. Lordship is massive today. I believe that one of the reasons why people don't come to Christ is because they want to be their own boss. They want to be their own God. They want to be their own Lord. And I'm telling you what, man, what an empty way to be. What an empty way to travel because this world has nothing for you. This world has nothing for any of us. I'm telling you what, man, the greatest decision in anybody's life is to give your life to Christ and to submit your life to Christ and to bow your knee and say, not only do I believe that you saved me from my sin, but I want you to be the boss. I want you to be the Lord. I want you to be everything to me. And as we see this great picture of the distinction between teacher and Lord, I'm asking you to go to Matthew chapter 26. Now, if you were in your Bibles, you're in Matthew chapter 16. We're just going to the right a little bit. 
10 chapters. We're going to be, end up in Matthew 26. He's with the same guys that he was in with in Matthew 16. And I don't know about you, but I almost will guarantee that there's people in this room that I'm fixing to show you a text and that you've never seen it before, yet it's been in there the whole time. This this bone-chilling distinction of who Jesus is. Because Jesus said, who do they say that I am? Then Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And watch out, because I'm going to tell you, this is absolutely, you better get your seatbelts on, because I don't know. I'm going out on a limb, and I'll say, I bet there's someone in this room that has never seen this distinction, even amongst the core, even amongst the disciples. So Matthew chapter 26 As we answer this question, who Jesus is to you, the most important question we see in verse 20 of Matthew 26, it says, Now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And no disrespect to um, whoever it is that wrote the picture, as we're getting close to the Last Supper, as you see this, whatever Ninja Turtle it was, or whoever it was, some of y'all get that later. I don't even know. I think it was Da Da Vinci, or I don't even know. But you know that big long table where Jesus is sitting there, right there in the middle, like glowing, and he got the Italian garb clothes on with the goblets and all these things, and and all all the disciples right there on the line. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Get it out of your mind, because I don't think that's what it looked like. It says that he's reclining at a table. Look, some think maybe on a pillow. This is an intimate type setting. This isn't, and, and no, no disrespect to whatever person did that, but it was a little bit different how it actually went down. That's just my personal opinion. He says, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. Here it is. As they were eating, he said, truly I say to you, that one of you is fixing to betray me. Now, none of us are the 12 disciples, but can we just take a moment, a second, just to try to relate to them as best that we can, maybe on an indirect thing? Listen, these guys left everything for him. These guys walked away from their businesses. These guys walked away from their families. These guys walked away from everything to follow him when he became not just teacher, but Adonai, Lord. And he comes to them and he says, one of you is fixing to sell me out. One of you is fixing to betray me. I don't know about you, but I think that's got to be a gut punch to the disciples. You know how I know that? Verse 22. It says, being deeply grieved. I don't know if you've ever been in a place of your life where you have been deeply grieved. But I'm not just talking about sad or not happy. I'm talking about a place in your life where you have grieved deeply. That happened to me when I lost my dad. And I'm still grieving. But these disciples, deeply grieved, it says, and then they begin to say, one after another, verse 22, Surely not I, what? Lord. Surely not I, Lord. I wouldn't do that to you, Lord. Not me, Lord. Not me, Adam. We've been on this deal together for the past going on three years now. Surely not me, Lord. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't betray you, Lord. Can you just step in that setting for a moment just to see how hard that that would have to be for those guys? Deeply grieved, surely not I, Adonai. Are you with me this morning? We're going teacher, rabbi, Adonai, Lord. And these guys hear the the bombshell that he says, one of you is fixing to sell me out. And in verse 23, And he answered, he who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not even been born. And here is the moment. Here's the verse that maybe I think many of you that have read the text in your whole life have never possibly seen this before, but this is the distinction, this is the difference, and this is bone-chilling in my opinion. 
And you get to verse 25. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, teacher. Surely it is not I, rabbi. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. I don't know if that affects you like it has affected me every time I see it, man. Bone chilling. Do you see the difference? The fact is that even one of the closest to him, when everybody else was referring to him as Adonai, when everybody else was saying, not I, Lord, not me, Lord, I wouldn't do that to you, Lord. Do you see the difference at the end when he gets looked at by Judas and says, not me, teacher, not me, rabbi? Which brings me back to the last question, which is up there already. Who is Jesus really to you? Who is Jesus really to you? You see, Jesus in our day has a lot of fans, but few followers. I'll say that again for the people in the back. Jesus has a lot of fans and few followers. You see, because who is Jesus really to me? Who is Jesus really to you? It should impact every area of how we live. It should impact how we make a difference in the world that we get. It should impact how we live our lives on a daily basis because we're not even promised that tomorrow who Jesus is to you and who Jesus is to me should, should affect the way how we conduct ourselves online. And offline too. But Jesus is the same. Is He not? Don't we have an awesome text that says Jesus is the same today, tomorrow, yesterday, and forever. And the fact is, who Jesus is to you is only one question that you can answer for you. You can't answer it for your neighbor. You can't answer it for your family member. It's only a question that you can answer for you. So young person, middle-aged, senior adult, whoever it is, the spectrum of decades that we have in this room, if we really get to the, the level question is this, who is Christ to me? Really? Who is Jesus really to me? As, as Alex said earlier, I do have the opportunity to travel in this past summer, man, was one of those summers that I, I will go back and I will look I will look at in my life and I don't even know. If I begin to tell you some of the things that I saw, honestly, some of you might just say, I don't even believe you, dude, because it's that crazy. Eight weeks in a row, I had nine speaking obligations, most of them in camp settings. I'll just tell you this, a little snapshot. We had one camp of 265 students total. And there were over 200 decisions. 101 students committed to ministry. Do you understand what that, or missions, do you understand what that means? I believe that God is raising up a new generation of missionaries and ministers. And Lord knows we need it. You realize ministers and pastors leave the ministry? It's by the hundreds every single month, maybe even more than that. Maybe if it's a thousand or even more, walk away. I can go do something else that's not as stressful or whatever. Listen, I saw 101 kids say, I'm coming forward to say I want to be surrendered to ministry or I want to be surrendered to some sort of missions. That's an awesome moment. That same camp, it was Thursday night and the gospel was preached every night. I know it because I was the one that had the privilege to do so. Listen, this was an open-air tabernacle that was absolutely extremely hot. And I saw one girl on the last night of the camp in southeast Oklahoma from the back of the tabernacle run to the front of the tabernacle to give her life to Christ. I'll never forget that moment in my life. The fact is that she heard the gospel and said, if that is true, and if what Jesus and who Jesus says he is, I want that man. And that little young lady, she ran from the back all the way to the front. Incredible picture. Man, I think some of us need to run back to him again. 
And there's some of us that need to give our lives to Him for the first time. If you don't know, I listen, I'm not asking you if you're on a church roll. Because a church roll ain't going to get you there. Jesus is going to. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way. And it might be an old song, but people still need Him. People need the Lord. I was in South Texas at a camp that was absolutely crazy hot. Open air tabernacle. Monday night of the camp. The, the, the gospel was preached. Decisions happened. A youth minister comes up to me, another one of these stories that I'll never forget. And he says, I just want you to know that we have a, an 11-year-old boy named Patton. And he began to tell me about Patton. This 11-year-old kid, man, I, I immediately registered with that. Why? Because my son Cross is 11. And he said, until tonight, Patton had never heard the gospel. A kid lives outside of Austin, Texas. I said, what? I said, we don't live, this is part of the United States. Texas is still part of the Bible Belt, right? I said, you're telling me that this young boy has never heard the gospel truth? He said, no. He goes, but you want the rest of the story? I'm like, okay, give it to me. I'll never forget this. He said, this kid, 11 years old, and I'll be sensitive to the crowd, but he said this kid at 11 had already tried to harm himself with his life twice. 11. 11. And he said, but tonight he heard the gospel for the first time. And he was one of the dozens that gave his life to Christ. And I said, praise God for that. It's not about me. It's about Christ. It's not about me. But can you imagine at 11 not ever hearing the gospel? There are 11-year-olds in Joplin, Missouri that have never heard the gospel. What are we doing? Jesus is my answer. Jesus is my ticket. Jesus didn't. This isn't the Polar Express. Jesus died for you, and He died for me. And whoever gives their life to Christ, we have been made new. But this young boy, Patton, man, he, he, later in the week, he, he said, hey, it's kind of a different camp setting than what you all are probably used to. But he, go, he caught me outside somewhere. He goes, hey, would you, eat lunch, would you eat dinner with me Thursday? It's where all the kids come into this cafeteria. It's different than Falls Creek where we have our own cabin and do our own food. Everybody eats at the same time. I said, yeah, man, I'll eat with you. So we're talking, and he's just glowing. He began to tell me all the other junk that he was going through in his life. I don't have time to even tell you. But I'm telling you what, man, chaos after chaos after chaos after attack after attack. There's, there, there's an enemy that didn't want that 11-year-old boy to hear the gospel. And now he's a child of the king. Now he's different forever. You know what he asked me, though? He goes, just, I mean, typical 11-year-old. He goes, why do you sweat so much? <laughs> and I said, because it's 1,000 degrees in that open air tabernacle first of all and I'm a big dude and I get excited about talking and I mean I'm sweating right now if you can't see it of course you can he goes why do you sweat so much and I, that's what I said he's like all right cool you know and then we started talking about something else same camp I'm fixing to get in my car and I know I know there's another kid named Isaiah at this camp. And Isaiah had never given his life to Christ. And he still didn't on the very last morning of the service. And to be honest with you, that's the hardest thing for what I do in that ministry. In any ministry, any minister can relate to that. It's a hard deal when you know somebody is lost and they leave lost from a camp like that. And I was praying for him. I have a ministry on prayer group that's secret and private that everybody in that prayer group has been asked permission to be there. 
because of the sensitivity of the names, and that kid's name was put in there. His name was Isaiah. Man, I'm telling you, he comes up to me as he's fixing to get on his bus, and as I'm fixing to get into my car and go to the next camp. He looks at me and he says three words. I'll think about it. Four words. I can't add right now. I'll think about it. And that was it. I've stayed in communication with his youth minister. He still hasn't came to Christ. So you got the balance. You got the Patons who hear the Gospel. You got the Isaiah who heard the Gospel but still didn't choose. Listen, if you're in this room this morning and you've never given your life to Christ, then today is an option for you to do that. In a moment, I'll invite you to come forward. There'll be people up front that would love to talk to you about that. If salvation hasn't happened in your life, today is the day for salvation. Wouldn't that be awesome this morning, church, to see somebody come to faith in Christ? You know what else I would love to see? Even in this church, maybe I'll just start doing this myself, but we have prayer options in the front, and sometimes we have people that will come up. Listen, I wish there would be men and women every Sunday, and I wasn't asked to say this, but I see this in other places. I wish there would be people that would come to the front every Sunday morning and pray for this church. Pray for a revival to happen. You guys want to see revival? That, that we would get on our faces again. Get on our knees and say, God, move in my life. Maybe there's somebody in this, in this room, you know that if you were to die today that you would be in the presence of Christ. But you've been on the bench. You're not actively in the game. People don't know that you have Christ. Man, it amazes me that how in the world can we accept the love of what Jesus has given us and we don't talk about it? We don't tell people about it. When there's 11-year-olds and 21-year-olds and 31-year-olds and 51-year-olds and 71-year-olds and probably even 91-year-olds around us, they don't have a relationship with Christ for whatever reason. Man, may we be burdened again as the people that do. Amen? May we be burdened again for people in general that we've been given this awesome gift of salvation. So, as I've asked you this multiple times, who is Jesus really to you? I think the answer is going to be determined when we leave this place today and tomorrow. Jamie said last week, I knew I was preaching last week. He said, hey, if there's a question, if you want to invite somebody, if you want to bring somebody, it's happening. Listen, you can do that next Sunday too. To invite somebody to come and to worship and to hear the truth in the gospel. If you've never given your life to Christ in a minute, come forward. If you've been on the bench and you want to get back into the game, I've seen, I've seen 70 plus people over, over the course of our travel ministry recommit their life. I saw a 76-year-old grandpa do it one time. I was like, that's one of the coolest things. I asked him, I said, man, how did that feel? Are you kind of concerned or worried about coming forward? He was in front with a bunch of kids. He goes, no, I'm not worried about that. He goes, I haven't been in the game. I haven't been living my life, but I want to get back in the game. I want to get back and live my life and point people to Christ. At 76 years old, the man recommitted his life. Maybe this morning you come down front and pray for our church. Maybe you pray for a revival. Wouldn't it be awesome too sometime to see entire families come forward and pray together at the front? Doesn't mean you got some issue. We're past that, man. Oh, I'm not going to go forward because I'm afraid of what some people might think. Listen, that was, that was ages ago. But families and people coming forward and praying for this church that God would move and that revival would start here. If God used 12 men to change the globe, what can He do with this church? It's going to happen sometime. I just would like to see it happen here. Wouldn't you? Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.